Can you see my screen there? Yep, I sure can. I can't see any of the participants. Can you? Yeah, we've got two participants logged in so far. Okay. Probably uh, good could morning, everyone. Um, just thank you for joining us. Uh, we will get started here in a few minutes, but we'll just give a little bit extra time for anyone else to join in. We'll begin right at 10 o'clock a.m. So if you haven't already, grab your coffee, tea, water bottle. Uh, we'll get started shortly. And also feel free to type any questions in the Q&A box if you have any questions uh, before we begin. All right, it is 10 o'clock a.m. So um, if a few more people trickle in, that's totally fine. Welcome, we're so happy you're here. My name is Lauren Kleppen and I am the Water Conservation Specialist here at Big Bear Lake Department of Water. Thank you for joining us this morning for our WaterWise webinar series, Water and Fire and Plants, Oh My. Today we are featuring guest speaker, Laura Allen, and she is here to share her class on Gray Water 101. Laura is an author, lecturer, and the founding member of Gray Water Action. She has spent over 15 years exploring low tech, urban, and sustainable solutions. So today is our third session in our webinar series and our very first workshop on Gray Water. The first two sessions featured Orchid Black and Douglas Kent, and they covered Big Bear native plants and the essentials of fire protection in firewise landscaping. If you missed the first two sessions, we encourage you to join us for the next set of webinars next month in August, and then again in September. Webinars are held every first, second, and third Wednesday of the next two months. 
First Wednesdays are focused on native plants and gardening and landscaping tricks. Second Wednesdays are focused on firewise landscaping. And third, sorry, and third Wednesdays are with Laura and they focus on the use of gray water. So just a reminder, the first five DWP customers to sign up and attend live for each class will receive a free gift. These sessions are targeted to Big Bear Valley residents as well as business and property owners here. If you'd like to sign up for any upcoming sessions, please email me at conservation at bbldwp.com. Um, we will also post the registration links on our Facebook page, so be sure to follow us there as well. And last but not least, we do want to make sure that this is an interactive session. So please feel free to utilize the Q&A at any point. If questions are answered live, we will note that. If they don't get answered during Laura's presentation, we will make sure to address your questions at the end. Um, during the Q&A session, if you prefer to speak, raise your hand and hopefully we should be able to unmute you at that time so you can speak. And just one last little plug and a fantastic way to take advantage of the recent rain we've been getting. Um, all BBL DWP customers are eligible to receive a free rain barrel, one per account. Um, so you can email me or give me a call for all the details. Um, and you can also learn about our rebates on rain barrels. So rebates are $50 for each rain barrel purchase and good for up to three rain barrels for your home. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Thank you and welcome everybody. I'm gonna share my screen in just a sec and we'll get started talking about gray water. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? Okay, so we're gonna jump right in to gray water 101 and for most of us, when we turn on the tap, clean water comes out. We're expecting it to come out as pretty much as much as we want. And sometimes we forget that that water came from somewhere. If it wasn't coming out in our taps, going down our drains, maybe being used to water our landscapes, it would have been in nature somewhere, maybe in the groundwater, maybe in a faraway river or a nearby river. And something else would have utilized that water. And then we use it in our homes. And many people have no idea how much water they use. So if you happen to be one of those people, I encourage you to, to find out how much water you use each day. And it turns out that Americans use more water per capita than pretty much anyone in the world. And even in places that have a really similar standard of living like Europe, Western Europe. And one of the main reasons for this, you might guess, is because of our landscapes. Our, Plants that many people like to grow require a lot of water because they came from somewhere else and now they're in a totally different climate that doesn't sustain them with the natural rainfall. And so we use this water, maybe we use a lot of it, maybe you don't, maybe you're very conserving and I'm sure you're all getting more and more conserving as we get into more droughts and we also have so many more options with upgrading our fixtures and appliances to use a lot less water. Um, but we use this water and it goes down the drain and for many people that's the end of the story, we don't think about it anymore but it does go somewhere. And when there's a drought like California has frequently, and we know this is just gonna be, um, this is not going away. We're gonna need to be working with less water as we move forward. When there's a drought, this is a great time to really think about the water where it goes and what could we do instead? It doesn't have to be the end of the story for our water. And so that's where gray water comes in and what we're gonna talk about today. On average, we use about half of our water indoors and then half outdoors for irrigation. And that does change, of course, around uh, depending on your climate and your personal home, but that's the, the rough average. And our plants really don't need the same quality of water as we do. They can be completely happy with a non-potable water like gray water. And so we can, instead of sending the same quality, high quality water out to our landscapes, we can replace that with other sources of water. And so I just encourage people to think about, you know, when there is shortages, when, you know, we can't just keep going how we have been over the past decades, 
one alternative is just to not water and have these brown lawns. Um, you know, the last drought, the, the slogan was brown is the new green, but it doesn't have to be that way because we have a lot of water in our homes that we can direct out to our landscapes and we can still have lush, lovely, productive landscapes that don't take any potable water. And so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, the kind of how and the why of that and some things to get you started with gray water reuse. And so today we'll go over kind of just the basics of it. So if you're not familiar with gray water, you'll get a good foundation today. I'll share with you some popular systems and some basic calculations, some kind of numbers you want to think about so you can know how much of your plants you could potentially irrigate. I'll talk about regulations and then some kind of general strategies as you think about implementing gray water if it's going to work for your particular situation. And so kind of big picture, most homes produce about enough gray water to offset 16 to 40% of the total water use in the home. And that requires you to take water from your home, like from your sink showers and washing machines and send it out to a part of the landscape that you were currently irrigating and offsetting that. Some homes can't access all their gray water sources and I'll tell you why in a few minutes, other homes can. And if you see in this picture, if you have an existing home and you want to implement gray water, you're looking at lots of different gray water systems all working together. You can see this house, there's a washing machine in the front left and it's going to irrigate a portion of the landscape. There's two showers, they're going to irrigate a different portion. And all together, these gray water systems are working to reduce the potable need for this landscape. And that's really common if your house is already built. Um, these systems can create, you can grow habitat plants for your native birds and pollinators. You can um, just manage that water in a sustainable way. You can have moist landscapes that are help with fire prevention by having a, a moistened landscape at a suitable location. You're reducing your flows to either your sewer or septic. And it's also a really great way to reconnect to water and be aware of like what we put into our water, where it goes and how we can use it in the most ecological and beneficial way. Turns out in California, we produce a lot of gray water, about a billion gallons every single day is gone down the drain and the vast majority of that is not reused. Some communities have recycled water and so a fraction, a very small fraction of that is reused, but mostly that it's not being utilized as it could be. So on the big scale, there's a lot of potential. On the small scale, like your particular yard, you do have potential to reduce a lot of water. The previous percentages I told you were theoretical. This is this, this chart is showing some actual um, reductions in water based on a study that Gray Water Action did a couple of years back in various homes in California. And you can see the red line, that's the average monthly water use pre-gray water system, and then the black line is post-gray water. So with using gray water, you can pull down your curve. You can see the summer people use more water because they irrigate more. You can reduce the water. This depends on having a properly designed system. So it's really important that you get good education like you're doing, you're here at the webinar. That's great and it's great your water agency is promoting this and giving you these um, resources to learn more because you have to have a properly designed system if you're going to save water. The picture on the right is a classic example of someone that didn't understand the design, how design matters, and they you know, learned about gray water, they wanted to save water, they put in some brand new fruit trees in the middle of their lawn, and then they sent their gray water out to these fruit trees, but they kept watering their lawn. So they created a system that really didn't have the potential to save water. So you have to have a, a dedicated portion of your landscape that you're now irrigating with gray water and you're shutting off sprinkler heads, you're cutting off your drip, you're um, stop not irrigating as you were before because you've replaced it with gray water. So that's really key. And so getting to some basics, gray water is first from the washing machines. This is the easiest place to start if you want to reuse gray water. If you have a top loading machine, it's we produce about 30 to 50 gallons every time you do a load of laundry. If you have a front loading machine, that's less. It's about 12 to 25 gallons. And if you have a top efficient machine, that's about 15 to 25 gallons per load. So you can figure out how many loads you do per week, your kind of machine, and you can multiply. And that's the amount of gray water potential you have from your washing machine. They're the easiest source to tap into, um, and they're really easy to monitor what products go into the washing machine. You may have to purchase a new detergent. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then once you do, that gray water from your machine is suitable to irrigate all of your plants that you can. Showers and baths are another great source. They're often harder to access because you have to get into the plumbing of your home, and I'll show you some diagrams in a few minutes. But if you can access them, it's another great source of gray water. 
And then sinks, bathroom sinks usually produce quite small amount of water, uh, but sometimes it's easy to tie it into a shower system. Currently, kitchen sinks are not considered gray water in California. It's a state by state uh, classification. So kitchen sink water, you should just um, kind of put to the side if you're really excited about using all your gray water sources. And gray water is never from the toilet. It's also if you're uh, washing in cloth diapers, if there's uh, po poopy diapers, those would need to be redirected to the sewer. So gray water doesn't contain the fecal material that toilets do. And so is gray water legal? Yes, it is. It has been for many years. It's regulated by the plumbing code. It's in chapter 15. And some gray water systems, as I'll explain, don't need a permit and they're legal. There's health and safety guidelines that are important to follow. And if you follow them, your system is code compliant, legal, and you don't need a permit. Other systems do need a permit, and there is a pretty um, clear pathway based on the state code, but some local um, permitting agencies may not be as familiar. So that's something that if you're seeking permits, you might need to, you know, depending on who you're seeking the permit from, they may or may not have an easy pathway for you, but at the state level, it's totally legal and you can do it. Um, and there's lots of examples of cities and communities that have made the permitting process pretty straightforward and low cost for their residents. So how can you use gray water? The first way is for outdoor irrigation. And in a place where you have irrigation need, that is the best place to look. It's the easiest, um, it's the most affordable, it's the least amount of maintenance, it's the most likely to succeed for the long term. The other way you can use gray water is to flush toilets. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, like we do not need to be flushing the toilet water with the same quality of water we drink, but to get gray water, to get that water clean enough that it's not going to cause problems in your toilet, like clogging the, the flapping mechanism, causing leaks, degrading the rubber inside, um, the water actually has to be quite clean. So a toilet flushing system needs to be, have filtration, disinfection, it requires frequent maintenance, it's quite expensive. It's harder to get permits for because there's more risk. You have a pressurized non-potable water coming back into the home. So at the residential scale, the toilet flushing systems really aren't a very um, good option. Typically, they work and they are seen at the bigger building scale, like multi-family um, large buildings where they have a maintenance person on site who's maintaining all of the infrastructure of the building and they can, they can maintain these more sophisticated and um, intensive type of systems. So for you and your home, you really want to look for outdoor irrigation as the, the place to start with gray water. And so when we're using gray water for irrigation, what we put in the water is now going to our plants. And so it's important that you use what I call plant friendly products. So these are products, they don't contain a lot of salt, they don't contain boron, and they don't contain chlorine bleach. For example, um, Ecos is a brand that's found at many major grocery stores, <clears throat> even Trader, excuse me, even um, Costco has, often sells Ecos. There's other ones, Trader Joe's has a suitable detergent. Um, there's a lot of, lot of different options. You just have to know what you're looking for. So it's gonna be a liquid detergent or a detergent alternative, like those little strips People are getting more popular. Um, it's not gonna be a powder detergent that's full of salt. And you wanna check the ingredients for boron and make sure there's no boron or borax because that it can be harmful to plants if it builds up in the soil. And a couple of other <clears throat> general considerations is gray water is not potable. And we're really used to watering with potable water. When we have a garden hose, turn on the hose, the water coming out of that is the same water that's coming out of our kitchen sink or our shower. So with gray water, it's not, it's not the same at all. It's not potable, it's not safe to drink. We don't want people to contact with it. So we wanna make sure that gray water doesn't pool up. It should be <clears throat> soaking into the ground, feeding the roots of the plants. We don't want children or pets to you know, drink it, play in it, et cetera. We also don't want mosquitoes to breed in it. So we don't ever wanna see gray water. It should be going down in the ground. We don't want people to have direct contact with it unless you're doing maintenance where you know what you're doing, you have your gloves on, you, know, you go back inside, wash your hands. That is fine to do the maintenance, but in general, you don't want anyone to have a way to access that water. It also contains nutrients. When we put nutrients in our garden, we call that fertilizer. That's a good thing, or nutrients on our plants. But we don't want nutrients to get into a waterway. They cause algae to grow, and that's a source of water pollution. So gray water should never run off our property. It should never enter a storm drain or a creek or a river or a lake. Um, because that would cause pollution in the waterway. So there, the code has setback requirements to make sure you don't get too close to any of these potential issues like a storm drain or a creek. 
And you should be aware of that. That's why it's because of nutrient pollution. And the last one is gray water is not potable, so we don't want it to touch the part of the plant we might want to eat, like a root vegetable. So root vegetables are prohibited by code. There's other plants that are probably not a good idea, like lettuce or strawberries or things that are laying on the ground, the part that you eat. But anything where the food's above the ground is totally fine. What you're trying to avoid is directly getting gray water into your body, because if someone you know, else's germs were in the water and then it got into your body, that could cause illness. So no root vegetables, um, no vegetables touching the ground, but fruit trees are great. The food's way above the ground, berries, raspberries, you know, anything where the food's above the ground because the gray water's going down into the ground. And so with, I'm gonna talk about some simple gray water systems and they're simple in that they work really well and they require little maintenance and they're on the more affordable option of the systems. So with the simple systems, we are using mulch. I'm sure you're familiar with mulch. We're using it strategically to act like a filter in the landscape. So it's absorbing, it's filtering, it's catching all the gunk and lint and debris in the gray water, and then it soaks into the soil. So this prevents gray water from clogging your soil. It prevents puddling of gray water or runoff of gray water. So it's used as a natural in-ground filter. We build what we call a mulch basin. So it's a shallow basin. It's filled with wood chips. So it's not covering your entire yard with wood chips. It's just a strategic location near your plant that you're watering. And you're digging out some soil. You're filling it with wood chips. And that's where the gray water goes. So it's filtered. It spreads out through the basin. And <clears throat> it, again, prevents pooling or runoff. And it gives a lot of capacity. So if you do extra loads of laundry on one week, there's somewhere for all that water to flow into that basin. And then it can so slowly soak down into the soil. We also use what's called a diverter valve. So this is a valve that allows you to direct the water either to the sewer or septic or to the landscape. So let's say you are gonna wash poopy diapers or you do wanna use chlorine bleach or dye your hair or something that, or you don't wanna send that water out, you just turn the valve. There's also ways you can make it electronically um, controlled, flip a switch, turn the valve, and now the water's going back where it used to go to the sewer or septic and you want it to go to your landscape, you turn the valve the other way or flip the switch the other way and now it's going out to water your landscape. And so gray water systems, they can be very, very simple. Like this picture on the left, there is a sink. There's a pipe leaving the sink flowing by gravity into a basin that should be filled with wood chips. This picture is showing rocks, but it's just an example of a really basic system by a plant. You can look at that picture. If you're a handy person, you could build that. It's really not very complicated. Not a lot to go wrong. Um, to, get, to do an official system, you would need the diverter valve and there'd be a little bit more to it, but that's the basic idea. It's gravity flow going out to the plants. The system on the right, this is also a gray water system. It is what I'll call a high-tech system. It um, can be monitored by a smartphone. It can you know how much gray water is going through the system. If there's no gray water, it can pull in from another supply. It can function with a kind of similar to what you might imagine like a sophisticated drip system with a controller in different zones, um, even sensors. And that's also a gray water system. So sometimes people get confused or have misinformation around, around gray water because they may have seen or heard about one really sophisticated or high-tech system. They may think, oh, gray water is expensive. It's only for like super rich people. Um, and regulators might think, oh, it's so complicated, many things could go wrong. And on the other side, someone might be thinking, oh, I'm just gonna you know, pipe my water out to my plants. It's really not that hard. It's affordable, it's simple. It doesn't take a lot of maintenance. And they're both gray water systems. And so I want you to understand that there's you know, many ways to use this water from the very simple to the quite complex. And I'll show you some, we'll start with the really simple ones and I'll then we'll end with some of the more high-tech ones. The simple systems, they are really good for irrigating larger plants. Um, this is just a logistical thing because they don't spread out the water as much as a, like a drip irrigation system does. They're more like spot irrigation. So they're great for your bigger plants that need more water. Each plant needs more water because it's a bigger plant. Trees, bushes, vines, larger annuals, and perennials are excellent plants for these simple gray water systems. They're not good for lawns or small plants. You can do that with a sophisticated complex type, which is gonna be quite expensive um, and pretty high maintenance, but it is possible. It's just not typical in a residential situation because of the, the logistics and the cost and all of that. 
Uh, and let me go back. You also cannot spray gray water. It's always going subsurface. So sprinklers, can you can never put gray water through a sprinkler system. So the first simple system is called the Launchy to Landscape, and there'll be a webinar just on this kind uh, later on. So if you think this sounds like something that might work for you, please come back to that one. It's really the most flexible system. It works in the most situations. Um, it doesn't require a permit. You can follow basic health and safety guidelines and you're totally legal. You don't actually have to change your plumbing at all because you're connecting to your washing machine. It's an appliance. It has a pump in it and it pumps out the washing machine water through a discharge hose. So with this system, what we do is we take that appliance, the washing machine, it has a discharge hose. We connect it right to that valve. You can see in the image, there's a diverter valve. And one side of the diverter valve goes back to the sewer connection. So when the handles turn one way, you haven't changed anything about your home. The other side now goes to your gray water system. So you do have to get outside. Um, so there'll be a small hole in the house, either through the wall, like in this image, the washing machine's on an exterior wall. Sometimes people have a crawl space. So you can go through the floor and then follow, go out under the house and then pop out somewhere. So you do have to have a way out either through the floor, through a crawl space or through an exterior wall. Once you get outside, it's similar to a drip system, except we're, we have bigger outlets. So we're going through larger diameter tubing to larger diameter outlets. So we're kind of spot irrigating our plants. This is a conceptual drawing. So it looks like the water's on the top of the ground, but actually all of this is below ground. And it goes out and you irrigate your plants. So you do laundry, you water your plants. And you've done the design where you know how much water you produce and then how much your plants need. And so you match them up. So you're adequately irrigating your plants. You can see that the cost is relatively low for a home improvement project. It's a couple hundred dollars in parts. This is very um, doable for a do-it-yourselfer. If you work on your home, if you put in irrigation, if you fix you know, something that breaks, this is working with plastic pipe. Um, the only, the most challenging part is you do have to get outside. So there's one hole that needs to be drilled into the home or the floor. Um, or sometimes people have a, an existing like old vent that's not used. Sometimes laundry rooms are on the garage or even outside. So depending on your setup, that could be really easy, but that is overall the most challenging part of this system. Um, so the great project for a do-it-yourselfer. It's also uh, usually a one, maybe two day project if you hire a professional and you can see the cost. It's a couple, maybe 700 to $2,500, depending on your, your site. You know, some people have a sidewalk that you need to either dig under or cut a piece of strip, a strip of cement out. So there can be things that take a little extra time to raise the cost, but it's generally pretty straightforward. So here's some pictures in the home. There's the valve, uh, one side's going to the sewer, the other side's going outside. The image on the left, it's going through the crawl space out the floor. The image on the right, it's going straight out the wall. So that's a, a laundry room on an exterior wall. In the landscape, you see the tubing, it's one inch, so it's a bit bigger than regular drip, and the feeding tubes are half inch, so it's, it restricts the flow slightly, so that way you can send it to multiple outlets, but it's still big enough to let the debris and lint and stuff in the laundry water. And it's going into the basin. This picture is a kind of almost finished system. So when it's done, the pipe will be buried, the mulch will be filled all the way to the top. Those little black things are called irrigation valve boxes and they're open on the bottom. So it's just to keep it so roots don't grow back into the gray water. So the water flows out through the air, lands into the wood chips, flows out and irrigates the roots. There's little green caps that go on and then the basin will be all the way filled up. Um, there's some limitations and I'm gonna go into that a lot more in the, the webinar about Longy to Landscape to help you kind of match your gray water production and your landscape and how you can do that. So I won't talk about details today. Here's some finished pictures, the image on the left, that row of fruit cheese is being fed by the washing machine. All you see is those green caps in the end. The image on the right, they're kind of hidden by the plants, but this is kind of showing you two really well-suited landscapes. Trees are great, fruit trees, you get fruit, so that's always nice. The other image on the right is showing a lot of um, bushes and flowering perennials, which are also really well-suited for this type of system. So now we'll get to all the other kind of gray water systems. So now when you're tapping into your showers, your sinks, you have to cut into your plumbing. So that's gonna trigger a plumbing permit to do that gray water. So you do have to access your plumbing and then you have a diverter valve. In this image, you can see that diverter valve. Um, you can 
manually change that valve or you can add a component that makes it electronically operated and then you can have a switch in your home and then you reconnect to the sewer and there's a backwater valve that makes it so sewage can't back up into your system and then you run outside with that um, new gray water pipe. The most, um, if you have the setup, kind of the next best system is called the branch drain. It's a gravity flow system. And so to install this, you first have to be able to access your plumbing. So you can't have slab on grade foundation. That doesn't work because your plumbing is buried in cement. So you need a crawl space or a basement or somewhere to get some way to get to the plumbing. You put in that valve um, and then the landscape has to be lower because this particular system relies on gravity. The great thing about gravity is it doesn't take any energy. It's never going to break. Uh, it's free, you know, lots of benefits. Um, but you have to have the right setup. So if you can, if your yard gently slopes downward or if it's flat and the plants are relatively close, you can make your pipe deeper to use gravity to get to your plants. Um, this particular system is really well suited for trees. It can irrigate larger shrubs and things, but it, it's better for the bigger plants just because of the limitations and how far you can spread out the water, like how many points you can divert that water to. Um, so you can see it's flowing by gravity. There's these special fittings that, that passively split the flow in two. So now you have on one side, half of the flow is flowing out. You divide the flow again, you have a quarter, maybe you have an eighth and you've calculated what's the suitable way to set up the system based on how much water you produce in this shower. Um, so the cost, uh, it's a little more in parts, about 250 to 500 professional installation. It's a lot more work because you are sloping the pipes now. There's no pump pushing the water through. It's required um, gravity is, is using is working. And so you have to really meticulously slope your pipes. So it takes more time. It's not particularly challenging to set up the outdoor portion, but it is more labor intensive. And there is also the place where you have to put in the valve. So you're altering your plumbing. So you want to know what you're doing um, if you're going to do it yourself or hire someone that can change that plumbing. Sometimes it can be really simple. If you have plastic pipes under your house, it's pretty easy. But if your home is old and you have steel pipes or old cast iron, then it can be a pretty, um, can be quite more, quite challenging to cut into that and put in the valve. So it's going to vary a lot more. So here's some pictures. Picture on the left, you can see that valve. Um, so there's two ways it's going to the landscape or the sewer. The picture on the right is that motor I referred to before. It's called an actuator. It just physically mounts onto the valve and then you run the switch into the home so you can control it from inside. And here's a picture. This is a very small yard. This is in San Francisco. So the yard, that's the entire yard. It's a one bedroom, very small house, very small yard. And this um, family, small family, their one shower can water their one yard. So it's kind of a good showing how this can match. In many homes, the one shower would just irrigate a portion of the yard, um, but in here, it literally irrigated the entire yard. And you can see the pipes are being um, going out into the landscape there. The basins are dug, the basins are filled with wood chips, the plants are planted adjacent to the basin. So as the water soaks down, the roots grow under and can access that water. And so here, the picture on the left, that was right when it was finished. And the picture on the right was one year later and they said they never watered their yard again. So that's pretty nice. And so now we'll get to the situations where you can't use gravity and you still wanna use your shower water or bath water. You might have an upward sloping yard or you might have a big patio or something to cross over before you get to your landscape. And then you might need to pump your gray water or you will need to pump your gray water. Um, there can be a pretty simple pump system. You do still have to divert the gray water, so you have to access the plumbing. So that still, you know, is a limitation for some homes. You put in the diverter valve, you send the water into a tank. It's a small tank, usually about 30 um, gallons, maybe to 50 for a single family home. It's not storing the water, it's just temporarily collecting it. And then the pump has a float switch on it. So as the float switch rises up, when it gets full, the float switch rises up, turns on, and it pumps out all the water and you pump out gray water, unfiltered gray water into your landscape using the wood chips as the filter once you get there. So it does require power. So you have to have somewhere to plug in the pump and the permitting is a bit more challenging because now you have non-potable pressurized water. So there's sort of more things that could potentially go wrong. So it's important that you're really doing this right. Um, but it's technically, you know, it's not hard, totally doable. 
and works really well. So here's some pictures. The picture on the left, this home had a basement. So this pump was located in the basement. The picture on the right, it's in a crawl space. So it's sub partially buried in a crawl space. So you can imagine that one took a lot more work to get that you know, set up, burying, digging under the house and, and burying that tank. Um, so you can imagine if you'd need a pump, like where would you locate this tank? Where would you plug it in? Those kind of logistics. Um, and before I get to this one, so when you pump out the water from this simple pump system, it's really exactly the same as the laundry to landscape. So it's one inch tubing, half inch outlets. Um, you can go to more places because this pump is a little more powerful, but basically you're going out into these spot irrigation in your landscape. Sometimes people don't want spot irrigation, they want drip irrigation. So drip irrigation, the water has to be quite clean, otherwise the emitters or the, the places the water comes out will clog. And so you have to filter the gray water before it gets into the irrigation system. Um, filtering gray water is the number one source of system failure because when your filter clogs, then your system doesn't work. And if, you requ if it requires a person to actually clean the filter out by hand, that is a very um, likely source of system failure because we are human, we forget, maybe we're excited about it when we first put it in, but a year later, who wants to clean out their stinky, smelly gray water filter on Saturday, like I don't. Um, so you have to be, if you think you need a filter, I just want you to really ask yourself, are you gonna clean it? Or better yet, get a maintenance contract, have someone else whose job it is to come clean your filter, if this is what you're thinking might work for you. So that's my little caveat. So now we have the filtered gray water. So now it can go through a specialized drip system. So the picture on the right is just, this is not gray water going through that, um, but just to see, you can see how the water is now moistening a very large area. You can have lots of plants, they can be spread out, they can be lots of little plants. You don't have to have the mulch basins, you can just cover that with um, some kind of mulch, either wood chips or straw, depending on what plants you're irrigating, and it can go over a larger area. Gray water, filtered gray water is going to be dirtier than fresh water or well water it still requires a special drip tubing. So you can't just filter gray water and put it into your existing drip system. You're going to have to alter your drip system or redo your drip system. So don't think that you can just adapt to what you already have because it's still dirtier and it will clog it up. There are also systems that filter gray water and don't require a person to clean the filter. And these systems are gonna be more likely to succeed because they don't require on a human, they do it automatically. So of course they're more complicated and there's more moving parts and more electronic parts and more things that can break. So they are more prone to failure than the really simple systems that rely on gravity and, and natural systems like the wood chip filter. Um, but if you're looking at a whole house system, I encourage you to look at the ones that have an automatically clean filter because that they will still require annual maintenance. Everything requires annual maintenance, but annual maintenance is a lot less than every couple months maintenance. So here's some systems. Um, Irigray is one system. It has a filter that catches all the lint and gunk and then it goes through a specialized gray water drip system. And this filter on a timed basis turns itself around and back flushes and has the filter cleaned out with potable water. So that's a way for the filter to be automatically cleaned every, I believe it's every week or two that it does this. So it, it stays going for at least a year before you have to do anything. Rewater is another system that uses a sand filter that catches all the lint and gunk and then it's back flushed by fresh water. Um, water Sprout, um, this is a San Francisco Bay Area company that does filtered gray water and um, they have their own um, custom design that they do and, and use. All of these systems cost a lot more than the previously mentioned ones. As you know, it's obvious, they're gonna be more, they're more complicated, um, there's more to it, there's, the installation is higher. It's not a do-it-yourself project. You'd really want someone who knows what they're doing to install this for you if you are interested in this type of system. And of course, you know, gray water can be used in a larger scale. I'm not gonna really talk about this, but just if you're curious, there's examples of really big buildings that are utilizing gray water in combination with other non-potable water supplies for toilet flushing. These are places that don't have irrigation need like downtown San Francisco, um, or this is not quite downtown, but um, yeah, there's, they're all over in San Francisco. So if you're interested, you can look into some of these large scale buildings and see what's um, happening with on that scale 
totally different technology, you know, really different than your backyard gray water system, but it's a great way for these big buildings to reduce their potable water needs. So I'm going to conclude and then we'll get to questions. I'm going to conclude with common errors and then a little bit about design. So people often hear about gray water. It's very logical, like we should be reusing what we have, but they might hear about gray water and learn about it a little bit at the same time as learning a little bit about rainwater. And they're both strategies to conserve water, but the way you use them are really different. And sometimes people kind of mix them together. So they think I need to store gray water. That's the number one error. Storing gray water, uh, for one, it turns into a stinking, it's really, you know, it's not in this, okay, imagine taking a shower or a bath when you're done, the water is really not very dirty. It's a little dirty. You're not going to, you don't want to drink it, obviously, but you can touch it. You could pour it onto your plants and not think anything of it. But if you let your bath or your shower water sit around for a week, it would be a different story, especially if it was in a dirty tank. It gets really smelly, odorous, all the oxygen in it is used up, it smells anaerobic. It's really not something that's nice to use anymore. It's also illegal, you, 24 hours is your legal limit. Um, so you don't wanna store it, the quality degrades and it just causes a lot of problems. Um, also, since we, use, we produce gray water almost every single day, there's no benefit to storing it. You could try to store last week's gray water and have a lot of problems, but you're making gray water today that you could use really easily. So there's no benefit to storage. Rainwater, on the other hand, you definitely want to store. It's really clean. You have a couple of filters and you can store it safely and easily without any problems. And you do want to store it because it rains and then it might not rain for a long time. We don't get rainwater every single day like we do gray water. So don't store gray water. You store rainwater, you don't store gray water. Um, the second common error is overuse of pumps. Sometimes people think they just have to pump. It has to have a pump. And sometimes it does, but often it doesn't. And the third one is misuse of filters. People often think they have to filter gray water before it goes into their system. Um, and sometimes you do, but it's the, the least common type of system and it's the most prone to failure kind of system. If you can get the water out and do a natural filter in the ground with your wood chips, you have a lot less maintenance. You only have to check on your system about once a year and maybe do some easy maintenance. Um, and it's a lot less likely to fail. So misuse of filters is a problem. So this is a kind of a, this is actually literally an email I got a while ago about someone's plan. And they said, what do you think about my plan? So they said, I'm gonna pump my gray water to the top of my property, store it in a 500 gallon tank, then gravity flow it down the hill to irrigate through a drip irrigation system. So you can see that this person is, has pretty much every common error in their design. They wanna store it 500 gallons, you know, that would be very smelly. Um, they're pumping it to the top of their property they, they do need a pump because it looks like they have a hill, but you don't want to pump higher than the highest plant you have. Uh, that's just wasted energy. So if you were going to pump your gray water, you just pump it to the highest plant and then go down. You don't ever want to go to the highest point in gravity flow. You uh, waste energy and you lose the pressure of the pump to make it easy to irrigate. And then they want to use drip. You don't need drip on fruit trees. Um, they want to use drip and they don't have a filter. So their system is going to clog up. So they could make this a lot simpler with a simple pump system. And so here's a site, um, what would you recommend? So you'll just think, this person has a house, their yard slopes downhill, all the plumbing is accessible, they have a big crawl space. This is a pretty ideal setup, but everyone wishes this was their home if they're planning a gray water system, and they have 10 fruit trees. So one side of the home is the showers, the other side is the washer, they got all these fruit trees. So you can think, you know, do they need a pump? Definitely not. Do they need to filter this water? Probably not 10 trees, they could, they could get to all those plants with two different gray water systems. So they can utilize gravity. Um, they could do a laundry system from their washing machine and irrigate some of those plants and a gravity branch drain system from their showers and irrigate other plants. They'd have to do some more work, figure out exactly how much gray water they have and then how much their plants need and then accommodate that by choosing, you know, maybe, maybe one of their fixtures irrigates four of the trees and the other six or vice versa. And that would just depend when you get more information. So that's a really kind of common setup. You'll have multiple systems working together. And so I'll, I'll conclude with some design considerations. So you first wanna ask yourself, what sources of gray water can you access? Maybe it's everything, that's great. Maybe it's just your washing machine. And that can be kind of common. And then how much does your home produce? To do a little bit of calculations. 
then what plants will you irrigate? You're gonna match the amount of gray water that you make to the weekly needs of your plants. Um, you're gonna hydrozone, so you'll keep plants with similar water needs together. So that way you can shut off a whole zone of irrigation or you can have a whole section of plants that you don't need to water. Um, that will get, maximize your savings. And then you're gonna choose a system that will meet your needs. And just, um, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you or have it feel like, oh, there's so many things we have to learn. Just to take a little pause, if you're really excited about doing gray water and want to plan your system, just a little pause and look at your overall landscape. And maybe you've already done this. Many people have, but some people haven't. And it's definitely fine to do, you know, piecemeal, like, oh, I'm going to put in this system and then that system. Um, and I encourage you to start with the easiest one that'll give you, you know, success to move on. But if you're able, just kind of take a step back and look at your overall site, look at your home, look at your different options. Uh, maybe you also have rainwater options. Um, where would you put your rain tank if you're going to have one? Um, where does it make the most sense to put your, send your gray water? If there's parts of your landscape that you don't have any non-potable water, maybe that's a great place for really low water use native plant garden. And so, this is showing kind of a bubble diagram where you just really simply sketch out, circle out the areas of your landscape and you think about irrigation. And the goal is to reduce as much as you can the amount of potable water going out to your landscape. So in this home, there's a couple of gray water sources and the shower can go easily go to the side of the home and irrigate fruit trees. The washing machine, that water can go farther because of the pump. So that can go around the home and irrigate a perennial bed. Maybe they have a privacy screen. We're gonna skip over the play area. If maybe that's a lawn, maybe it's not a lawn, but it's a place that people um, have a lot of contact and is flat and doesn't have big landscaping. So that would not be suitable. And you can see that there's these different parts of the landscape that are well suited for gray water. And then rainwater could maybe water the vegetable garden or that could be on a drip system. Uh, with potable water. Most homes don't have enough gray water to do their entire landscape and so you want to start with the plants that are the easiest to water and then work your way down. Usually run out of water before you have to consider should I water my vegetable garden or not. Um, so you usually don't even need to ask yourself that question. And then in this home in the front yard that could be a great place for a rain garden to manage the, the storm water off the roof or off a driveway if there is one and then a low native plant garden too. So if you can you know, I encourage you to do this, but not not to get paralyzed by, oh, no, I have to have an entire plan for everything and I can't start on anything yet. Definitely don't think that's the way to go. It's always good to get a plan, use the info that you have, um, try something. You can always change it. It's fun to work in your yard, or I think it's fun to work in the yard and try new things. So we'll end with resources. Graywateraction.org is the website. There, there's a lot of resources on there. Um, there's links to videos, recorded webinars about really specific topics, um, all sorts of info. There's also a forum. So if you have technical questions, you can put them on the forum and get answers there. Um, yeah, and, and hire an installer page. We list people who are trained graywater installers. So if you're looking for an installer, hopefully you can find someone that is in your area. Um, yeah, so go there for the general website, general resources. I'm listing some books. There's a free downloadable manual. It's called the San Francisco Gray Water Design Guideline, and it has a lot of info. It is geared to San Francisco, so the plant information is not going to be the, the right match for you because San Francisco requires less irrigation, but it can give you a lot of good info, and it's a free download. Um, I wrote two books, and so those are designed to help people do their own either design it themselves, build it themselves, or get good information so they can work with a professional and feel confident that they're gonna get a good system. Um, there's some, there's an Ask This Old House episode that has gray water info on it. So you can watch that or share that with, if you need to convince your partner or other people in your family, that's a good kind of short seven minute intro. And then there's some you know, info for materials that you can get. So I'm gonna end there and I'll stop the screen share so we can, um, get to some questions. Let me un, I'll fix the host thing too. Let's see. So does anyone have any questions? Looks like we had one that was answered already. 
I will bring it up again, though, just in case um, Lisa Patterson asked, and this was about rainwater, not necessarily gray water, but her house doesn't have gutters or downspouts and was asking whether or not they can still use a rain barrel. Uh, I answered and just let her know that they can also use rain chains. I thought that that was something that everybody else might learn from. Rain chains are a great um, inexpensive option that you can hang off of the low point in your roof to direct that water to a rain barrel. At the Department of Water, we do require the rain gutters and downspouts for our free rain barrels, um, but just throwing that out there for you guys. And there is one other question, go ahead. Um, so do you want me to read it? Can you see it, Laura? Um, let's see. Do I need a pump to move gray water up a small rise to a tree or can I water on the low, lower level near the tree? Um, so Dana asked that question. And Dana, if I'm not fully answering, feel free to, to chime in. Um, so uh, trees usually have, their roots are much farther. If you imagine the end of the branches, that's called the drip line. The roots of a tree go out to the drip line and beyond. So if you're trying to direct water to a tree, I mean, the ideal place if you have a slope would be, you know, upper portion of the drip line so the water can soak down and move down. But if you're watering on the lower portion, the tree will grow more roots to access that water. So as long as you're near-ish to the drip line of the tree, like the edge of the branches, then the tree will be able to access the water. So you have multiple options. If one place you can't irrigate and you can go to a different portion that's still in the drip line of the tree, the tree will be able to access the water. And then Lisa asks, no need for rain gutters with a rain chain. I don't know if that's directed to Sierra. Laura, do you have experience with those? I know I've seen them used with gutters. I've also seen them used just generally at a where people see the water naturally sloughing off of a roof, where the water just kind of naturally tends to come off of a roof, they've put a rain chain. But if you have a different experience, we'd welcome any, any input you've got on that. I've only seen them with gutters, so I, I don't know about without gutters. So yeah, I've seen them at a cabin where basically the, the roof had a seam. So the water gathered at the bottom of that seam already anyway. Um, and so they used a rain chain at that corner. That makes sense. So it was already essentially an angle, angled part of the roof um, where the water would gather and somebody used a rain chain there. Um, I do see that Vicki has her hand up, so I'm gonna allow her to talk. Vicki, do you have a question? Vicki, you just need to unmute yourself. It should be in the bottom left of your screen. There should be a mute and then the video option. Uh, if if Vicki, if you still have a question, maybe you can type it in the chat or question box, question and answer. Do feel free to email us though, Vicki. We can always pass that question along to Laura afterwards if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so if we so if you don't have access to a mic or you're having a hard time with that QA panel, just feel free to send it to us and we'll be sure to get you an answer and send it to you. Any other questions? And Lisa, I'll do a little research for you on the rain chains and send that to you. I've got your email too. Um, Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, just wondering if anybody knows in Big Bear Lake, if they have the detergent, they sell it here that you would use for the gray water in your washing machine. You mentioned Costco and Trader Joe's. Obviously, we don't have those up here. So I was just wondering if anybody knew um, if they had that eco detergent in Big Bear. I don't, unfortunately. What's the biggest, I don't. Um, store you. What's the biggest grocery store? Yeah. Bonds. 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 Um, yeah. I haven't been to Bonds for a, a while, but Bonds used to have used to sell a suitable detergent. Um, 
I'm not sure what brand it is, but I could look it up if they, if I can find it online. But the Vons that I used, to, I used to live near a Vons, and I would get a detergent there. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see any other questions. Uh, we do have a comment from Orchid. She says, "Thanks, Laura. Great presentation. Where can I find your book?" Um, so Greywater Green Landscape, a lot of libraries carry it. it there is a, some electronic versions if you do like eBooks. Uh, Google Play has one, it's the most affordable option. And then you can buy it in, anywhere you buy online books. So it's readily available on the internet, the hard copy. And we are buying a few of Laura's books to be given away as part of those BBLDWP gifts. So once we get, we, I, we take stock of everybody who shows up on our webinars and who registered, and then um, we'll be in contact with everybody to let people know whether or not you're one of those five who qualified for that. Well, if there are no other questions, I think that maybe we can end the session now. Um, just want to say thank you to Laura for your great advice and expertise in sharing today. And thank you everyone that came in and attended live. Um, again, those five, those first five um, will be given a book. Um, so that's something to look forward to. If you haven't already, be sure you sign up for our other sessions. You could just email Lauren, or again, you can always sign up for them using the links that we post on Facebook. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks everybody.